All right, guys, so uh, now that we've done fiscal policy and we've done monetary policy, we got to put everything together and have it make some sense. So uh, on our graph right here, we're going to go through and do some of the stuff that we've already talked about a little bit and uh, see how it all comes together. So we have our king graph, aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Looks like this. I was pleasantly surprised and pleased at how well everybody was doing their aggregate supply, aggregate demand graphs on the assignment uh, from last week. Uh, I'm used to that looking terrible slow at this point. It may have helped that some of you were using templates or were able to look at notes, but hey, at least you were doing that much. Uh, lots of times it, uh, yeah, I wound up getting some really sad things. Uh, sometimes people will put on their like SRAD, S-R-A-D, which isn't a thing. All right, so let's say their economy looks like this. We're in long run equilibrium at the moment and we hit a recession. So as we know, in a recession, consumption drops, investment drops, which means aggregate demand will shift to the left. When that happens, price levels fall, getting deflation and output falls also. Okay, remember, when output falls, this also means uh, that unemployment is rising. If we're not producing as much, that means that we do not need as many workers to be able to produce stuff. All right, those goods and services. So, uh, price levels fall, output falls. All right, so, uh, what do we do about this? Again, in classical economics, you don't do anything. Uh, eventually, SRAS will shift to the right to achieve long-run equilibrium again. Uh, if we're going to be policy guys, then uh, we can do something right now. So we can use expansionary fiscal policy or we can use expansionary monetary policy. Or we can do both. We can do both of these at the same time. Spending is too little, so uh, we can do uh, both these guys. Now, Fiscal policy, one of the downsides of fiscal policy is that uh, it can cause the crowding out effect. Crowding out effect. All right. Oh, I've been messing with uh, cursive writing quite a bit here. Let's see, I'll try doing it that way. Fiscal. Yeah, it's probably not much better than normal writing. All right, but the crowding out effect is this, is that when you're doing expansionary fiscal policy, it can have unwanted side effects. The whole idea of the crowding out effect is not that this is what we're trying to achieve, but what happens accidentally, all right, as a side effect of the expansionary fiscal policy. Now, we do know that if we do expansionary fiscal policy, okay, that involves lowering taxes and or raising government spending, all right? But something weird happens, and we're going to look at this in the loanable funds market. Now, remember, loanable funds graph looks like this. We have the quantity of loanable funds, excuse me, real interest rate, the demand for loanable funds, and the supply of loanable funds. Now, you remember that in this graph, this is uh, the loanable funds out there in the banking system, the money that is there to be loaned out. Uh, so, and the uh, demand is going to be the people wanting to borrow it. Okay, so that means the supply of little funds is roughly savings within the banking system. You save your money in the bank, that creates the loanable funds within the banking system. And the demand for this is borrowing. Okay, well, when the government is doing expansionary fiscal policy where it is going to tax less and or spend more, Right. Think about this for a second. The government is spending more at the same time as it is bringing in less money in tax revenue. So we're just going to get the difference. Right? If it's going to spend more money than what it brings in, uh, then it has to borrow the money. 
all right? So the government has to go into some debt in order to be able to get that additional money that it is going to spend, all right? Which may be necessary because, again, the government is spending more while bringing in less in taxes, okay? Now, on the loadable funds graph, what that means is that the demand, which is borrowing, is going to shift to the right. There's going to be a bigger demand for loanable funds within the economy. Okay, so the demand for loanable funds increases, and when that occurs, it raises interest rates. But this is a problem because higher interest rates are the exact opposite thing that you want. Okay, if you're doing expansionary policy in the middle of a recession, you don't want higher interest rates, you want lower interest rates. Okay? The problem is that people are spending too little and you want people to spend more. And the way you do that is through lowering interest rates. But the side effect of the government's expansionary fiscal policy is uh, that it is going to borrow money, which increases the demand for loanable funds, which raises interest rates okay so the higher interest rates instead of getting more uh, uh, borrowing and more spending is going to wind up getting less okay so it's counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve okay so the government sector the public sector is crowding out private sector and private investment okay you're going to get less consumption and less investment by businesses because of these higher interest rates all right so what do we do? Well, we couple it with expansionary monetary policy. Okay, so we'll do both the expansionary fiscal policy and we'll do expansionary monetary policy. at the same time, right? So we can use one of the three tools, right? So if we're doing expansionary monetary policy, we can lower the discount rate. We can uh, lower the required reserve ratio, and the Fed can uh, buy bonds on the bond market. Okay, the end result is that if we look at our money market graph, the Fed does expansionary monetary policy. We increase the money supply, so the money supply curve shifts to the uh, right. When that happens, it lowers interest rates. Okay, so we counteract the unfortunate side effect of uh, the expansionary fiscal policy. All right, you don't have to do this over here, but essentially what's going on is that the increased money supply will shift the supply of loanable funds to the right because people save more when there's more money out there. And the result would be, excuse me, uh, undo that, 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 that. Yeah, the way I drew it right here, right, the interest rate would be a little bit lower than what it was. If we were to draw the line even further out here, then we would have, right, the intersection would be out there. So interest rates go down further. All right, so this is the crowding out effect, okay? Again, the crowding out effect is not the purpose or a goal of expansionary fiscal policy. It is an unfortunate side effect of a fiscal policy, okay? You get the same thing going the other direction, and that's called crowding in, but we typically don't talk about crowding in very much. Crowding in effect is that uh, when the economy is in an inflationary period, right, aggregate demand is shifted out here, and uh, what we want in this case is going to be contractionary fiscal policy, which means uh, less government spending and more taxes, right? So the government will spend less, bring in more money, and uh, the result there could be a decrease in the supply, or excuse me, an increase in the, uh, 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 let me rephrase that, a decrease in the demand for loanable funds, which would therefore uh, lower interest rates at the time when we're trying to raise interest rates with contractionary uh, policies. All right. So this is the crowding out effect. Sometimes crowding in comes into play, but not very often. It's usually going to be crowding out that is going to appear on test. All right. Another thing that we got to talk about real briefly is going to be automatic stabilizers.
Automatic stabilizers are things that occur within the economy that kick in automatically. So when we're talking about fiscal policy, we're usually talking about discretionary fiscal policy. Okay, so if we're talking about the uh, raising government spending or decreasing taxes, that's discretionary fiscal policy. The reason we call it discretionary is that the government has discretion over what they do with that fiscal policy. Uh, whether they're going to raise spending and by how much, uh, whether they're going to lower taxes and by how much, they have discretion over that. Okay, an automatic stabilizer is something that kicks in automatically. You don't have to do it. It's already there. So uh, an example of an automatic stabilizer is unemployment insurance. So if you lose your job you can go and collect unemployment. All right. Now, this is an automatic stabilizer because at a micro level, what this means is that if you lose your job, you're able to still go out and be able to get a job, uh, or excuse me, not get a job, but be able to have some sort of income, all right, to be able to survive, not get tossed out of your house. At a macro level, the benefit of uh, unemployment uh, benefits is that demand won't drop as much as it otherwise could. Aggregate demand won't drop as much as it otherwise could. Since people have still have some kind of income, disposable income, what that means is, is that consumption will not crater like it would if it wasn't there. All right. So aggregate demand will still fall during the recession, but it won't fall as much as what it would have done without the automatic stabilizer. Okay. And this is automatic. The unemployment system is already there in place. Yeah, Congress doesn't have to do anything to be able to make it happen. All right. A another uh, automatic stabilizer is uh, the, uh, the income taxes. Okay, income taxes are graduated. We have a graduated income tax system. What this means is, is the more money you make, the higher percentage you pay. All right, and it's you got tax brackets and stuff like that. It's not the case that you pay one percentage on all of your income. Instead, you pay different percentages on different levels of your income. But if we're in an inflationary period where people are making a lot of money, what this means is, is that as they make more money, they will fall into higher income brackets and therefore have to pay more of their income in taxes than what they would have uh, had to at lower levels, higher percentages of their income. So as the economy is doing really well, um, uh, this kicks in again automatically and helps to stabilize the economy. So aggregate demand will start shifting to the right because it's doing really well and people are making more money and spending more, but it won't shift as far to the right as what it could have done had it not been for the income taxes. Okay, and again, Congress doesn't have to do anything to make this happen, it's already there. All right, good. Another thing we got to talk about is this guy called the Phillips curve. Well, I'm doing this on a uh, Friday here. My daughter's here for band stuff, and she's sitting here really bored here. No. There she is. She doesn't want she. Yeah, there she is. She's really embarrassed at the moment because she doesn't want me to do that. So, but I'm her father, and so this is part of my job is to embarrass her. Huh? Oh, I don't know. I don't want to say. If I say too long a time, these guys are gonna like turn off the video instead of finishing watching it. So it'll take. Five more seconds. I might be lying. Okay, so the Phillips curve looks like this. Whoop. All right. So the uh, hold on. percent. The x-axis here is U percent, which is the unemployment rate, and the y-axis up here is uh, pi percent, which is the inflation rate. So what the Phillips curve is indicating is the relationship that exists between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. And what it shows is that they're inversely related. When the inflation rate is low, that tends to be coupled with higher unemployment rates. And when the inflation rate is higher, that tends to be coupled with lower unemployment rates. And where this came from was an economist, a New Zealand economist, his name was A.W. Phillips, and he looked at historical data in New Zealand, and then later uh, we saw the same things with Britain and the United States. 
is uh, this was the pattern, right? That historically, when inflation rates were high, the unemployment rate was low. When the inflation rate was low, the unemployment rate was high. Now, this creates an interesting dilemma because if you're a policymaker, let's say you're in government or a central banker, what you want is both of these to be low. You want low unemployment and you want low inflation rates. However, it looked like you could only get one or the other. All right, that you had to make a choice between what you wanted, right? Higher inflation rates and lower unemployment, or lower inflation rates and uh, have to put up with higher unemployment as a result. Okay, um, so this is what the data seemed to indicate. Okay, but along came the 1970s and it screwed many things up uh, music, movies, except for Star Wars, I guess. Um, uh, but it also messed up the nice, neat Phillips curve, right? What we discovered is that there's actually two different Phillips curves a long run Phillips curve and a short run Phillips curve. All right, and where the long run intersects here, that is at the natural rate of unemployment, okay? So the natural rate of unemployment roughly corresponds to full employment output. The natural rate of unemployment is going to be where the economy is going to be at when we're at maximum efficiency and output. All right. So this is about where you would see full employment output on the King graph, the aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph. All right. So this LRPC long run Phillips curve is roughly analogous to the placement of the long run aggregate supply curve. What this is showing is then the long run, this is going to be uh, where we're at, right? Is uh, at this uh, long run Phillips curve at this natural rate of unemployment, that an economy has a natural rate of unemployment that it tends to be at, right? And it will try to get back to this spot right here where the SRPC intersects the LRPC, all right? So, we can correspond some graphs here. We can correspond the aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph with this graph, all right? Um, and I'll add a caveat here. One of the things I've complained about in the past is that um, actual monetary policy and all that is completely different from uh, uh, what we've seen previously and uh, what I have to teach, and that's kind of the case here. The Fed doesn't really use the Phillips curve anymore. In fact, uh, many people within the Fed reject the Phillips curve because if you look at the historical data starting from the 1970s going forward, you don't see this pattern anymore. It used to be with the Phillips curve, you could uh, plot out all the points, all right? So the data from like the 50s and 60s, when you uh, plotted out the points of inflation rate and unemployment rate, it looked like this, all right? Where you put all these points and then you could see that there was a correspondence, right? Where if you were to average it all out and draw a trend line, you get this downward sloping Phillips curve, right? And so this is what we want. But if you look at the historical data from uh, starting in the 1970s going forward, it, it's all over the place, these points, right? So it doesn't look like uh, for the past several decades there is any sort of correspondence between the inflation rate and the employment rate. And part of this is because the Fed has gotten so good at managing inflation rates and uh, going for uh, maximum employment that uh, the relationship between these two has been kind of broken. So there's debate on whether or not the relationship between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate still holds in reality um, in modern macro terms. Um, some people say that there is no relationship anymore, and some people say, yeah, it's still kind of there, at least theoretically, things could go wrong, and we're going to be back to the Phillips curve world, so it depends on how you ask. All right. But we're going to match up aggregate supply, aggregate demand, and Phillips curve. see how the two work together and how what's happening on one tells us what's happening on the other one. Okay, so let's say that we are in a recession again. All right, we'll go back to our very popular recession scenario. Aggregate demand has shifted to the left. And uh, as we have seen before, price levels fall. 
and output false. Okay. Well, when we were here, right, this point right here, we'll label this point point A. That's where we started off, right? That roughly corresponds to being over here. Okay, when we're at long run equilibrium here, right, we're at long run equilibrium over here on the Phillips curve graph. Now, when we went into recession here, and this is the new intersection, we'll label this one B. All right, well, where would B be on the Phillips curve graph? Well, let's see here. Price levels went down, right? That's deflation. That means the inflation rate was getting lower. So what we want over here is to show that, that the inflation rate is going down, all right? And uh, over here, what we see is that output decreased, output fell. And remember, when output falls, that means that the unemployment rate is increasing, all right? When output falls, that means we're not making as much stuff, so therefore we don't employ as many people. So the unemployment rate is rising. So what we're going to have over here is the unemployment rate is going that way. So if we start off right here at point A, well, what's the movement we're going to have if the inflation rate is going down at the same time as the unemployment rate is going up? Claire's leaving. Bye, Claire. Bye. She has to go back to her band stuff. I just embarrassed her more. Okay. So inflation rate going down, unemployment rate going up. That means that we're moving along the line. So we'll be somewhere over here, right? So point A, right, started there and then moved along the line to point B. This corresponds with what we see over here, which is price levels falling and unemployment rising. All right, price levels fall, so that means lower inflation rate and rising unemployment rate, all right? So when aggregate demand moves, we're going to be moving along the short-run Phillips curve, right? When aggregate demand shifts, you move along the short-run Phillips curve, all right? Now, let's say uh, we do policy action, right? So we would get back aggregate demand to where it originally was. We back at point A, back there again, all right? But let's go back to our classical scenario, right? We don't take policy action, no fiscal policy, no monetary policy. What's going to be the result? All right. um, when that happens, what we have is that SRES will eventually shift to the right. Why will it shift to the right? Well, wages and prices get flexible enough. Remember that whole idea in the short run, they're uh, sticky. All right, wages and prices are sticking in the short run. They start becoming more flexible. And unemployment gets bad enough. Workers accept lower wages. I uh, can renegotiate contracts with my suppliers, all of that stuff. And it's profitable for me to produce more. So I produce more SRS shifts to the right. So we have a new point over here, point C. All right, and in point C, price levels fell some more. All right, so... We have the inflation rate going down, okay? But as output increased, so we'll have full employment, and we'll call that three also. So in this scenario, output increased, and increased output means that the unemployment rate fell. So we're going this direction, all right? Lower price levels. Here, I'll put a little arrow right there. Lower price levels, which means lower defla inflation rates, right? Lower inflation rates. And higher output means unemployment rate went down. So we're going this way, all right, on the Phillips curve. What's the only way we're going to get less of both? Right, both less uh, inflation and uh, lower unemployment. The only way to be able to get that is for the SRPC itself to shift. So we're back at long run again, right? 
we're back at long run, but we are at a lower inflation rate than what we were even over here. Uh, and uh, uh, we are at a lower unemployment rate than what we had over here at B. Okay, so we got back to long run and we didn't have to do anything. The economy adjusts for it. All right. And this is why you wind up having this inverse relationship, hypothetically, between uh, the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. If the inflation rate is higher, well, what happens? Uh, that typically that is, uh, means that people are spending more money when the inflation rate is higher, which means we're producing more, so the unemployment rate is going to be lower. All right? If the inflation rate is lower, that tends to happen when the economy isn't doing as well, which means we won't produce as much and the unemployment rate is higher. So that's the idea behind the SRPC anyway. All right? But here we see the dynamics and we see the connections between uh, our aggregate supply, aggregate demand graph and our Phillips curve graph. All right? Uh, the Phillips curve graph can also illustrate, by the way, why inflation uh, can be tempting and a problem. All right, so uh, what I like to say is that inflation can be like political meth. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say an economy is uh, here, right? So uh, it's at long run uh, equilibrium at the moment. And policymakers come along and uh, they're looking at this and they said, oh man, you know it would be great? If the economy could be even better, we could have lower unemployment. How are we going to do that? Well, all we got to do is inflate the currency, right? So if we we'll inflate the currency, that means we have higher inflation rates and then we'll have lower unemployment as a result. So they go off and they do that, right? And so they'll go from here, let's say they wind up over there, right? Ah, man, look at that. So here they raise the inflation rate and then as a result, they had a lower unemployment rate, okay? But here's the problem, is that as we saw, the economy will adjust to the new value of the money over time. You can inflate the currency in the short run, you're gonna get this economic high, but eventually the economy will adjust the new prices within the economy and uh, the new value of the money and it will uh, work around it, right? So it's like we said, if you double the amount of money in circulation, eventually you'll just have double the prices, double the wages, you'll be right back where you started from. So what happens is that eventually the economy adjusts and you would get a new SRPC that would look like this. It would have shifted to the right, right? And you get a new equilibrium that's right there, right? And so uh, what the policymakers say is, oh man, this is no good, right? Unemployment is back up, uh, output is down. What do we need? More inflation! And so they'll try to inflate the currency again. All right, so they'll go out here, right, and uh, have an inflation rate. So we get uh, roughly that same level of low unemployment. But eventually what occurs is SRPC will shift even further out, and then it'll shift further out, further out, right? In order to try to maintain the same low level of unemployment, what you need is higher and higher levels of inflation in order to try to achieve at that low level of unemployment. All right, because the SRPC keeps shifting further and further to the right, all right, which means in order to get that low level of unemployment, you need more inflation to try to achieve it. All right, so I say it's like political myth because the policymakers take that first sweet hit of inflation and uh, get that economic high. Um, uh, but it's impossible for them to get that same high as what they were before, right? So it's like in math, uh, the brain uh, adjusts around the increased dopamine levels. It starts to close off dopamine receptors. And so the meth head starts, uh, can't get that first high, but they keep trying to chase it by taking more and more meth, basically. So the policymaker is trying to chase that same economic high of low unemployment will uh, start using more and more inflation to try to achieve it until eventually things are just off the uh, charts and the economic crash, the economy crashes, right? Because the only way of uh, getting ourselves back to normal levels again is going to be to lower the inflation rate, cut the money supply, do contraction rate policy, right? But when that happens, woo, the unemployment rate will wind up going way up as a result, right? So nobody, if you're a policymaker, if you're a politician, you don't want to be in office at the time because you'll lose your uh, legislative job, uh, or if things are incredibly unstable, you'll just die. 
All right. So that's the Phillips curve. Last thing I swear to talk about in this uh, remaining stuff is uh, the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money is a very simple equation. It is MV is equal to PQ. MV is equal to PQ. M is equal to the money supply. V is equal to the velocity of money. P is equal to price levels. And Q is real GDP. All right. And uh, PQ, I'll note, is equal to nominal GDP. Okay. So collectively, PQ, this side is nominal GDP. All right. And now, what you're thinking here with the velocity of money is what happens if I throw a dollar bill? Uh, velocity of money is how quickly a dollar changes hands within the economy. Okay. So MV is equal to PQ. Uh, the money supply times the velocity of money is equal to real GDP times the price level, right? Or the money supply times the velocity of money is equal to a nominal GDP overall over here on this side. Okay, the quantity theory of money was put forward by some uh, economists, and Milton Friedman, for example, is big on this. And so the idea here is that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. All right, what they advocated for was when we're adjusting the money supply, Instead of doing all this crazy discretionary monetary policy where we uh, raise and lower the money supply and affect interest rates and all that stuff, what we should do instead is have a rule. All right? And what they discovered is that, again, looking at the historical data, the velocity of money was relatively stable. That's what I mean by that line. Velocity of money was holding relatively stable. All right? At the same time, Real GDP is increasing, right? We're producing more stuff over time. So over time, our GDP is increasing, it's going up, all right? So this is staying stable. This is going up whether we like it or not. And what we want is price levels to remain stable, all right? So their theory with the quantity theory of money, MV equals PQ, sometimes we'll see this say MV equals PY, they'll use Y instead of Q, same thing. All right, but their theory is what you need to do is increase the money supply at the same rate as the economy is expanding. All right, so as, as, uh, real GDP expands, you expand the money supply at the same rate, right? If you do that, then you'll maintain stable price levels. But if you're doing this uh, wacky discretionary monetary policy where we raise and lower the money supply as we see fit at the time, you're not going to get this. So this is what they advocated anyway, all right? Now, again, uh, <laughs> There are difficulties with this. This was the 1980s creating a problem. As the increased use of credit and credit cards came on the scene, it really messed up this whole velocity of money, all right? Historically, the velocity of money was nice and stable, but then along comes the 1980s and it started going like this, right all over the place, all right? So that messed up the whole idea a little bit. Uh, now, when it comes to questions on the test that involve this equation, MV equals PQ, uh, typically, they're going to test either the idea that you expand the money supply at the same rate as uh, real GDP it increases as the economy expands. So that's one way they'll do it. Sometimes they'll give you numbers, all right? And they'll give you uh, three or two out of these parts, right? So they'll give you uh, M and they'll uh, give you M, they'll give you P, and they'll give you Q, and they want you to find V, right? So at that point, it's just solving for X, right? So they give you uh, three out of the four parts, that's all you gotta do. Sometimes they'll give you something like this, M and uh, PQ together, 
right? So they'll say nominal GDP and because they're testing your ability to understand that PQ together is nominal GDP. And then they'll ask you to solve for this, all right? So usually it's just solving for the missing variable, right? So they'll give you three out of the four, right? Or they'll give you two out of the three if they're using nominal GDP uh, as a unit, right? PQ together, right? Okay, but that's most of the missing parts here that we've yet to cover here when we're combining fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and I'm going to cut it off there.